And welcome and thank you all for your time today and and feedback and input uh, that you'll provide in conjunction with today's virtual stakeholder engagement session with underrepresented groups, diversity, equity and inclusion, workforce development, connecting the dots for the next two hours from 10 until noon. My name is Sharon McLennan and I'm the director of the Newfoundland and Labrador Workforce Innovation Center at the College of the North Atlantic and your moderator of today's session. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat window on the right side of your screen. In the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq. I would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatulavut and the Inu of Natasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. Um, you've all received the agenda, but I thought I would just walk us through that. Um, before I turn it over to Jeff to do the virtual housekeeping. So, of course, the right now we're in the middle of the welcoming and opening remarks and, uh, and that will include uh, and then we'll go to housekeeping and then our keynote speaker, Stephen Tobin. Uh, we'll have then breakout sessions to look at 3 questions in each of those breakout sessions. Uh, um, the sessions will be uh, or the questions will have be assigned 20 minutes each. They'll all have a note taker and a moderator. Um, and then we'll reconvene back for just short closing remarks, um, including the next steps. So, um, the I'll hand it over to you now, Jeff, for the virtual <laughs> housekeeping, and uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about NLWIC, and we'll go from there. Thank you. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Sorry about that. I had to. Uh, I had all my slide decks in order, and all of a sudden they weren't in the order that I wanted them to be. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead now and go through the housekeeping for WebEx a little bit, and then I'll turn it back over uh, to Sharon. Uh, so once again, the uh, recording, the presentation portion of the meeting will be recorded, and uh, the individual set breakout sessions will not be recorded. Uh, it will not be uh, distributed on any platform. The uh, recording, uh, pre sorry, the presentations will be, but everything else will not be. Uh, video for attendees has been disabled by default and microphones have been muted. To maintain a conversational, and this is more for the breakout session. So to maintain a conversational flow, please raise your hand and your facilitators uh, will show you how to do that and wait to be recognized by the moderator or session facilitator. Once recognized by the moderator, you can unmute your microphone and you can do this by pressing either the space bar or speak or clicking the, the unmute audio button on the task bar at the bottom of your screen. And of course, the chat window, uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat window on the right hand side of your screen. Let us know who you are and where you're from. Uh, and of course, if you have any comments to make, uh, please put them in there as well during the presentations and uh, we'll be sure to address them uh, if necessary. So what is the Chatham House rule? The Chatham House rule helps to create a trusted environment to understand and resolve complex problems. Its guiding spirit is to share the information that we have, uh, but to not reveal that the identity of who said it. So this is uh, one of the things that we run our breakout sessions on. The rule itself reads as follows. When a meeting or part thereof is held under the Chatham House rule, participants are free to use the information received but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any participant may be revealed. Uh, as well, the Newfoundland Labrador Workforce Innovation Center respects your privacy. Uh, so we are administrator, administered by the College of the North Atlantic and we may collect your personal inf information during the webinar to ensure we have additional ideas, uh, comments and suggestions related to diversity, equity and inclusion, workforce development, connecting the dots, which is being held right now. Uh, this will be used to inform the operations of the NL WIC and any further activities that we may be doing. It's going to only be used for these purposes and all responses are stored anonymously and de-identified. So no one will have uh, any, any, any idea who says what. The uh, College of the North Atlantic's authority to collect this personal information is the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act uh, in 2015. So if you have any questions regarding the collection of information, Please feel free to contact our stakeholder engagement coordinator, Suzanne Daw, uh, at the email listed there, suzanne.daw at nlwic.ca. So how do I use the Cisco meeting, uh, Cisco WebEx meeting space? So I'm sure uh, we're all used to online meetings now, but just to give you a quick overview, your mute, unmute microphone is right here at the bottom of your screen. Start, stop camera, share content, uh, and leave the meeting, uh, but we hope everybody sticks around for the for the two hours. 
You can also change the size and layout of the screen that you're looking at. Uh, you can see all the meeting participants uh, at the top of your window if you open that uh, open that panel, as well as the chat. And to do that, you can open and close the participants and chat win windows at the bottom your bottom right hand corner of your screen, where it says participants, chat, and then we've got a small ellipsis there, which I'll get into next. Uh, how do I raise my hand? So this is during the fac facilitated discussions. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand by hovering over your name, and you'll see a little <laughs> icon next to your name that will raise your hand for the facilitator. Uh, and and once again, uh, you can close, open and close the chat panel here in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. How do I use closed captioning? At the bottom of your right hand screen, you'll see three dots. This, this is called an ellipsis. You can click that and it will open up a small window that says closed captions right here on the side of your screen. And all of your closed captioning will appear here. And we do have a closed captionist who is following along with the uh, with the meetings this morning. And uh, she'll be putting all the information in, in this panel on the side. Unfortunately, the closed captioning does not appear with the speaker in the main window. It does appear here on the side. Uh, so hopefully everybody will be able to see that and utilize that. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And if you have any technical issues, you can contact me at jeffrey.keeping at nlwic.ca, or you can give me a call 709-637-8646. Or if you have Skype, you can find me there. Uh, and that's probably the easiest way to get me so I can uh, open up a, a chat session in a Skype window. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sharon. Uh, so Thank you. she can do her introductions. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I just wanted to very briefly talk about the Newfoundland Labrador Workforce Innovation Center, or NLWIC, as we're often referred to, um, just to give you, you know, to give you an update on what we've been, uh, well, what we were originally mandated to do, and some, and some of our new mandated activities, and where this would fit today. Uh, today's session would fit in that uh, those new mandates. Um, we were established by the provincial government in 2017. Uh, our Full team of six now, uh, which will be increasing over the next uh, couple of months, um, was ramped up, I guess, fully ramped up in May of 2018. Um, and uh, our original mandate uh, was to bring all of the labor market stakeholders together to provide that coordinated central point of access to do that, to look at issues and challenges and opportunities and solutions to address labor market challenges. And the opportunities, and we know we were established because of those uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, declining work, uh, sorry, declining population, aging population, changing technology, and all the dynamics that would go with that. But we also like to talk about the opportunities in the labor market that we were uh, set up to address, and that is really the the opportunity for a, a, a broadened talent pool that would include all of our citizens, in, including underrepresented groups. And that's a key part of our mandate. So our goal really is to promote um, the research, testing, and sharing of innovative models of workforce development that will have a positive impact on employment, employability, and entrepreneurship. So we had originally had four core activities, stakeholder engagement, research funding, best practices, repository, and capacity building. And we've done some really great things in, 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 a, in a couple of those areas. We're currently, um, we have a portfolio of 20 research projects, for example, that are looking all, at all kinds of uh, ways to improve the workforce and workforce development. So um, the, the new mandated activities that we have are pretty exciting. We'll be rolling out uh, regional workforce development committees uh, in the in the coming months, and that is actually going to be wrapped up in a, a research project that's been funded by the Future Skills Center. So we'll be testing really those committees and their action planning as a new model of workforce development, and we're really excited about that. Um, and so stay tuned for for things uh, all things uh, around that. Uh, one of the other mandated activities, which we've rolled into that that uh, particular. Uh, project is the testing of uh, new technologies and platforms related to labor market information. Labor market information is critical and those committees are going to really need to have access to the latest real time and forecasted uh, labor market information in order to make sure that we're matching the workforce demand and the workforce supply so we can actually uh, move forward with a workforce that's driving and contributing to the economic development and recovery of this province. 
So the final uh, mandated activity is, is really what we're doing today. It's this is the third of four phases of a of consultation process, really, uh, around with underrepresented groups around challenges and opportunities to their participation in the workforce. So we've had two pre consultations, one with organizations representing underrepresented groups and government departments. Today's virtual session will contribute greatly to to our, our final report, which is the fourth phase. So thank you so much again for um, for uh, what you have to say today, because it will inform our final report with recommendations. Uh, I just want to end before I introduce uh, Stephen with one slide, Jeff, which is just the common themes. I'm not going to describe them. I'll just list them. I'll okay. have to say that the the ones that I'll just I'll just read down through, which you'll see on your screen, are really common themes, and we've had uh, we've listed the mentions there. But this may in fact stimulate some of your thinking. But we we hope that you'll either that you'll bring your own ideas and about labor market challenges and opportunities to the table. But we heard a lot of things about uh, some barriers and opportunities around target programs and services for underrepresented groups. The digital divide was a huge one. COVID-19 impacts, multiple barriers uh, and complex needs, labor market information. We heard that uh, consistently, the, the, the need for accessible labor market information, literacy and education levels, um, career and employment services was another a common theme. HR perceptions and processes re related to employers, wraparound supports, government funding, um, and again, barriers, but also there are challenges, but also opportunities related to all of these, poverty, attachment to the workforce and finding language and cultural differences. So these are some of the common things. What we'll be doing is gathering the common things from today. And as I'll say at the end, we'll be making sure that you get a copy of those along with the recording of today. So right now it gives me real pleasure to introduce Stephen Tobin. We've known Stephen for, I guess, almost three years, Stephen. And uh, whenever we go, we, we've been in Ottawa a couple of times and we always make sure that meeting face-to-face -face with him is really critical. We've done a couple of small collaborations. We're looking forward to a larger one now in the coming months. And so we're very excited to have Stephen here today. He, Stephen is the executive director of the Labor Market Information Council, which is a not-for-profit organization whose mandate is to ensure Canadians, stakeholders, and policymakers have the necessary information and insights to succeed in a changing, dynamic world of work. Before joining LMIC, Stephen previously held positions at the uh, Organization for Economic Development and Co Cooperation and Development, the OECD, the International Labour Organization, as well as the federal and provincial levels of government. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Tobin. Hi, Stephen, and thank you so much again. Excuse me. Yes, yes. If if I could just interrupt for one second, the captionist yes. is having a really hard time picking up the conversation. So, Stephen, if I could ask you to slow down in your presentation, we would really appreciate it. That's we really missed everything that you said, Sharon. Oh my. Okay. So, I yes, that's really good. Thank you for that. And I'm sorry. I'll uh, I'll slow down at the end for sure. So, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and hello, Sharon and Suzanne and everyone. Uh, great to be here and please, yeah, on the captions, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. Um, so great to be here uh, to chat with you today on, yeah, what has been in my mind a persistent issue uh, since at least I've been working on labor market issues uh, since really the past two decades, which is what is it and how can we do a better job? of making the most and providing opportunities for underrepresented groups. So my hope today uh, is to stimulate a bit of a discussion around what we know uh, and what we don't know in terms of some of these groups in the context of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. And of course, to the extent possible where the data exists, what does some of the, the regional uh, data tell us in terms of how big uh, the challenge may be, or put another way, how big the opportunity uh, is. And so, really pleased to to talk to you about this today. I will, in our journey uh, this morning, make a small little detour to talk about skills, um, which of course is, in my mind, kind of the the currency of the day, which I think. Uh, does merit a little bit of a, a detour and a bit of an elaboration of a discussion. So uh, with that, I hope 
yeah, what we'll see today will we'll stimulate uh, some of the breakout uh, discussions. So, just maybe first a small note on the context, right? So, last time we spoke really at a forum, not unlike this one in Cornerbrook, we were really, the world was different, right? Unemployment was relatively low, lots of talk around skill and labor shortages, and how underrepresented groups could help kind of fill that gap. But Clearly, today, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador is no exception uh, to this. We're seeing, obviously, higher unemployment, but still some emerging skill shortages, at least anecdotally. So, yes, uh, there's some argument or suggestions by some that while there is a widespread availability of a labor pool, uh, that pool of labor is not necessarily attuned to what some employers may be looking for in terms of skills. But I think it's important to recognize that when unemployment is high, we have to recognize that there cannot be an absence of uh, labor. So here, I just kind of want to make very quickly the distinction between a labor shortage and a skill shortage, right? I mean, it seems obvious maybe to everyone, but for us, yeah, at the Labor Market Information Council, it's really important to distinguish these two is that, look, one is we just can't find anyone to apply to the job, which is a labor shortage, which we here mm -hmm. find difficulty in understanding that uh, given kind of the current situation. And another is really there is an availability of labor, but it doesn't quite have the skills or competencies to sort of fill the need that's being sort of asked of uh, by employers. And so now we are faced yeah, with this situation of higher unemployment, uh, but nevertheless, some emerging skill shortages, which when I think about the future is really like an important time for us to discuss today, how is it that we can sort of plan, if I could put it that way, for what will soon likely be, and we've seen it before, lower unemployment, hopefully uh, still skills shortages to some extent, that um, it means the economy is growing uh, and there's a need for, for skilled labor. But what we want to avoid here, and I think this is sort of central to the discussion today, is while we're in sort of between the present and the future, what is it that we can do to reduce the scarring associated with the underrepresented groups who are really facing, I would say, a double uh, edge sword of being obviously faced with persistent barriers to effective labor market participation? but have also clearly been most impacted uh, by COVID-19 and its implications. And so what is it that we can do today to ensure uh, the investments in these individuals sort of pay dividends um, when things kind of return uh, to a quote unquote normal? In terms of looking terms at some of the data I did I did want to kind of touch on kind of two two issues in terms of what we see uh, available in terms of kind of the current unemployed pool and then also digging a little bit deeper in terms of some of the specific underrepresented groups so the table that you see here is organized by the economic regions, which you may or may not know is sort of the statistics Canada's definition of the the regions within Newfoundland and Labrador. And the numbers you see here are in essence, the number of unemployed people uh, in May by their previous occupation. Um, so here I've just listed the, the top five in terms of volume to give you a bit of sense of what the data at least is telling us in terms of what are some of the occupations that the current unemployed population held? 
Uh, obviously, to me, what struck me across all of the regions is really sort of the trades uh, are obviously uh, facing some challenges. So, there's uh, pretty consistent uh, across really the four regions in terms of the people really accounting for the bulk of the unemployed uh, population. Now, if I could turn maybe to what the data tells us on underrepresented groups uh, within Newfoundland and Labrador and these four regions uh, compared to Canada, I wanted to focus a little bit on uh, participation rates. So here too, these are sort of the most recent numbers from the last uh, labor force survey. Uh, before discussing this this table and, and kind of some scenarios that we've played around with here, I, I did want to take a brief kind of pause here and and point out that there's three three big groups that are missing uh, from this table, right? Uh, the first one is visible minorities, of course. The challenge with that particular data is well, the great news is uh, Statistics Canada has added to the labor force survey as of last uh, June or July, I believe, some key labor market status questions for visible minorities. But due to the relatively small sample size, the data is available only uh, for Atlantic Canada. And at this stage, we're unable to sort of break it down uh, by province and territory. So that's uh, absent here. The second Big gap is related to indigenous peoples, uh, of course. Now here in non-COVID times uh, at the Labor Market Information Council, we would have access to this data for Newfoundland and Labrador to some extent potentially by economic region. But in the context of COVID and our access to some of the underlying really micro data were limited to accessing this through a remote server, uh, which does not have sort of the variable related to Indigenous people. So that's sort of absent here. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, persons abilities. The good news, if I could put it that way, is this has been missing for a long time in the labor force survey. But Statistics Canada is now working on adding this uh, to its survey, but it's something that's going to be uh, forthcoming. Uh, so th those three groups are missing, but I did, I did want to kind of do a bit of analysis on youth, uh, women, older workers, and, and recent immigrants in terms of their participation in the labor market. And so, of course, the first thing that struck me was that clearly across all groups, the participation rate in Newfoundland and Labrador is less uh, than the Canadian average, uh, particularly so, I would say, for uh, older workers, which I think is really accounting for the big difference in the total. Uh, but obviously, there are some regions that are doing uh, better than others. So, for instance, when I look at women in the West Coast, uh, Northern Peninsula, the participation rate at about 85% is higher than the Canadian average. So, there is some uh, variability across the, the regions. I also did want to point out that uh, recent immigrants is the sort of exception to the rule here where the participation rate in Newfoundland and Labrador is higher uh, than the Canadian average. Uh, but here, yeah, due to sort of the sample size, we do not have the data uh, available by, by region, unfortunately. So in thinking about the potential of these three groups, uh, we did really just a basic scenario of, well, imagine if we could raise the participation rate of these three groups to the to national the average national. for that specific group. And so, you know, that's really in our mind kind of a minimum baseline scenario, right? You could imagine a different scenario where you bring up the participation rate of women, let's say, not only to other 
women in Canada, but why not raise the participation rate to be similar to that of men, for instance, right? So here, what we've done is simply assume that over time, you could imagine the participation rate reaching uh, the Canada average for each of those groups. And if you were able to do that, based on the size of the population of each of these three groups in Newfoundland and Labrador, you can see that combined, um, you know, it's it's a little more than 15,000 uh, workers in terms of the potential supplier that could be added to the Newfoundland and Labrador economy. So quite, quite sizable, um, I would say. But uh, I can, <laughs> I assume the question really is, well, yes, there's a reason right why some of these participation rates are particularly low especially when i think about uh older workers in terms of well where are these actual jobs going to come from uh stephen and we can't just magically raise the participation rates of individuals uh, if there's sort of no job opportunities for them uh to take up and so i i certainly uh, recognize that very valid point and obviously for me, when I think about that, the first thing we need to think about is obviously a growth strategy in terms of job creation, right? And I think this has particular relevance in the context of COVID-19 where, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we need to recognize that those that have been most impacted uh, by this particular crisis are the groups that we've been talking about so far today. And so, that is a little bit different than some of the other uh, recessions that we've gone through in, in the previous uh, decades, really, be it the financial crisis uh, or even, yeah, sort of the IT sort of meltdown earlier. And so it does beg the question that as we think about a growth and employment creation strategy, we need an entirely different toolkit when thinking about how we build back better, so to speak, or how we build an inclusive recovery, because the way we used to think about stimulating the economy post-recession uh, was often through things like uh, infrastructure, shovel-ready sort of projects, but I think we need to take a step back and realize that some of those more traditional uh, stimulation projects, if I could put it that way, are geared more towards, I would say, men, um, and not necessarily some of the groups uh, that we're thinking and talking about today. And so it does require a bit of a different mindset in terms of how we think about uh, those job creation strategies. And I think that's that's a really important point. The second thing I would say in terms of, you know, some of the policies and measures that you'll certainly talk about in some of the breakout sessions around encouraging participation among underrepresented groups is, while I, I recognize, of course, that the jobs need to be there, a few things I think we really, really need to bear in mind is that, you know, by giving someone the opportunities and the skill set and the credentials and education they need to effectively participate in the labor market, uh, there are job opportunities out there uh, on a constant basis. And so it's important, I think, to recognize that when someone does find a job, they're being paid a wage, they have an income, and this can have very positive spillover effects on the local, regional, and provincial economy. And I think that's something we need to, to bear in mind. Somewhat related to this economic theory of the yeah, what is technically the lump of labor fallacy, which basically means there isn't a finite set of jobs out there, right? So that there isn't one job that everyone is competing for, and that's kind of the end of the story. The reality is that, you know, when someone finds a job, they do start spending, which then creates other jobs. And so I think we have to bear that in mind as well, that there isn't this idea of a finite set of jobs that we're all competing for. And so um, in thinking about, yeah, building that inclusive strategy, I think that's an important concept to, to keep in mind. And then, of course, 
we really need to be looking at this from an investment perspective, not in terms of costs. And so um, when we help people into productive employment, obviously that has some tax savings benefits, but I think even more importantly, um, if we make the right investments now, um, we'll avoid, I think, to the extent possible, or at least reduce or mitigate some of this labor market scarring uh, that is associated with longer periods of unemployment. And so let's think about these as investments now for the future rather than uh, cost, because I think as we know from previous periods, I would say of higher growth, lower unemployment, that you know when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, and we're having difficulty finding people or the people with the right skills, uh, it becomes increasingly more challenging uh, and expensive to bring people back into the labor market when they've been out for so long. And so I think that's uh, also an important consideration. The third thing, and I'm, I'm glad Chair mentioned this at the beginning, is yeah, in, in a place like Newfoundland and Labrador, and what, what Chair uh, forgot to mention was I'm from Cape Breton, so not, not too far away from your side of the world is that obviously local needs and systems delivery matters a lot. And I'm really encouraged by the initiative of the regional workforce development committees. And so I think this is uh, bang on the way to think about this and bring all the actors together. The fourth brings me kind of to the little mini detour is skills, 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 right? And so I do want to take a, a brief moment to recognize really that look for the past few decades we've been really using education as uh, a means to measure skills and it was really a binary language associated with either i have a degree or i don't or the job requires a degree or it doesn't and that just doesn't fly anymore right and now we're really in this new uh, space and new language of skills and it's very complex uh, in some sort of taxonomies there's a thousand skills and so it's no longer uh, whether or not you have a skill or not it's really very much about the the competency of the skill that you have and how important that might be to the job. So it, it, it becomes uh, very difficult in terms of measuring skills uh, in terms of the lens of jobs rather than simply credentials. And I think we're really still very much at the early stages of, of how we sort of view jobs through this new lens and language. There, at least right now, Part of our work has been assessing what are the actual approaches today uh, to how you might measure uh, skills. One is sort of a simple taxonomy or classification system. The other is sort of online job posting data. And then, of course, you can ask employers uh, or some sort of hybrid. Um, on the survey of employers, uh, for the moment at least, this remains pretty untapped, I would say, mostly because employers don't want to be answering questions very specifically about every job that they might have on offer and then to compel them to then say okay for these 14 different jobs here are the 13 different skills i need here's the complexity of those skills and so this becomes very problematic from a data sort of collection perspective but i just want to touch briefly on the other two approaches, uh, which is really a, a taxonomy or a language which says, look, uh, here are all of the occupations that we have, and here are the skills that are associated with those and the importance and complexity. Um, the most famous one, of course, is the US ONET system, uh, where there are 35 skills associated with every occupation uh, within the US system. And currently, ESTC is working on something very similar uh, for all of the occupations. And so happy to talk a little bit more about that. But it is a static uh, system and is more or less associated with, I would say, broad uh, set of skills. 
The other one is uh, job posting data, which allows us to extract really kind of the key words uh, from online job posting. So the data you see here uh, is from jobs posted uh, in Newfoundland uh, in the last month. And these are sort of the highest uh, growing skills and then the number of online job postings where it's listed. It still remains pretty broad in terms of what we're able to say. So organizational skills, interpersonal skills, communication, leadership. So still broad uh, in nature, but nevertheless, you know, I think what we would say here at the Labor Market Information Council is whether or not it's a more of a a dictionary of sorts like the US ONET system or something like the online job posting data. These aren't meant to be, you know, very precise uh, surgical tools, but they are meant to kind of give you insights into actual data in terms of what might be happening. And then to use that as a sort of quantitative basis from which I think you should be having these uh, more local and regional discussions to validate the data um, as well as talking to employers and, and education um, providers. Also forecasting skills, uh, very difficult. Uh, one is to forecast employment first and then to map those to kind of the language you have, but you know, Sharon and I uh, and Suzanne have been talking about this for a while. To me, what's missing in really the pan-Canadian system of labor market information now is, is good information on the job outlooks. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, uh, doesn't really exist where it does. It's not very uh, systematic, it's irregular. And so taking that to another level uh, of how we might use that to examine future skill needs, I think is we're a little, uh, we're a couple of steps away from being there, but but certainly I think we can be starting by doing a better job of, of forecasting employment in, in the first instance, um, and then thinking about uh, skills. Only to say that there isn't very good information currently on, on the forecasting skills. Um, a few maybe final, um, kind of remarks in, in thinking about kind of policy design. A couple of these, I think you would have heard me uh, say before, but I think it, it, it merits repeating a few, is while we think about underrepresented groups, and that's an important lens through which we need to view kind of program and policy design, we should recognize that it's, it's not just the fact that the individuals are within an underrepresented disadvantaged group, but that policies and programs need to focus on what the actual barrier uh, or disadvantage is. And I think by doing that, there are lessons that can be, can be learned and drawn out in terms of how different policies and programs can help support uh, different groups, uh, be it access to affordable housing or transportation or childcare. Uh, can cut across many of the groups that we're talking about. So start with that kind of lens of how we think about uh, these groups, but then the focus I think very much needs to be on what the actual uh, barriers are. And then I think, yeah, this was very much in, in Sharon's diagram at the beginning in terms of kind of wraparound supports is that we just can't assume that we can provide uh, skill training and not think about the other support that the individual might need even to undertake the training in the first place, be it income support or some other uh, measures that are sort of needed as complementary. Um, and then of course, in terms of program policy evaluation, uh, this is something near and dear to me that yes, let's, let's try some new great things, but uh, let's strengthen our evaluation of what might be working and what might not be working. Um, because whether or not you enjoyed the program uh, has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on whether or not the program actually actually worked at all. So I would encourage all of you to think about how we can sort of strengthen that. And sometimes you can learn as much from what doesn't work uh, as what does work. And so to conclude, um, yeah, I would just say that, look, let's not automatically assume that the the jobs will necessarily be there. So we need obviously 
a broader strategy, but that that sort of recovery strategy needs to take into consideration those that have been most impacted, I think, by this crisis. And let's not forget that by helping people participate fully and productively uh, in the job market, it can also have positive uh, spillover effects. Also, together, we just need to do a much better job of how we tackle the skills uh, challenges. And then, yeah, for us here, the last thing I would say is we need to equip um, the intermediaries, so people like yourselves, with the tools and knowledge, and labor market information is one of those, to really kind of action uh, skills development in a meaningful way. And so I think here there's a lot of work that's needed in terms of how we can empower uh, intermediaries, at least from our perspective, uh, with better labor market information that can be used at least as a, a basis from which to be having some meaningful conversations around how we can make the most um, of supporting really underrepresented groups and and others uh, in terms of building a, a more yeah a rich and inclusive uh, recovery so with that i will stop and thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. That was a wonderful segue or bridge actually to our breakout sessions. Really appreciate it. Uh, stimulating lots of thinking, not only about the issues, but also really uh, both big, bold thinking about what we need to do to solve and address some of these issues, but also really practical on the ground measures that we can take. It's, and you talk about the inclusive recovery. That's a big priority for our province. And, uh, and again, a big priority for NLWIC. So if, thank you so much for your insights um, and, and just practical and uh, as well as big, bold uh, initiatives that, uh, that require change, but we can do that together. There's no question about that. There is a question that I have, Steve, and I wonder if I could uh, put that to you now. We have a couple of minutes, um, only one. Can I do that? Uh, you're ready for that, Stephen? Sure. <laughs> Excellent. Do, this is from Elaine Greeley to everyone. Stephen, do you know, do we know how Newfoundland and Labrador compares to Canada in unregistered employment or unpaid labor, like unregulated childcare? Uh, no, I mean, part of the challenge, of course, with uh, unregistered employment or yeah, informal or sort of black market economy is there's very limited or no information in general, I would say, and, and certainly certainly not in terms of how uh, Newfoundland may compare um, to any other provinces or Canada in general. So tough, uh, yeah, tough data to kind of uh, get at in, in that respect. So no, I'm not, not sure where, um, and I certainly haven't seen any recent studies of that nature, so. So, and again, another good segue, because 1 of our uh, questions that we'll be looking at in the breakout sessions is really what what research do you know about? Uh, particularly on Newfoundland about and uh, underrepresented groups that you represent. Uh, but what where the gaps in research? What do we need to know and find out? So, thank you. I think you've raised you've given us a wonderful uh, foundation to to move into to talk about challenges, issues, opportunities, and the whole area of research and research needs and how we fill those gaps. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to um, uh, Jeff now. Jeff, you're going to be uh, guiding us into the breakout sessions. And again, we'll have, I think you can confirm the numbers of sessions that we have, but uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. And again, thank you so much, Stephen. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And enjoy the breakout sessions. Thank you. Uh, hello again, everyone. So I'm going to uh, get everybody. Uh, you've all been pre assigned actually to uh, breakout session 1 of 4 breakout sessions. Uh, you do have a facilitator and a note taker in each session. There are 3 questions that will be asked during the breakout sessions. Um, and what we'll do is, uh, as the questions are being asked, I'll prompt. Uh, the facilitators and everybody in the groups uh, when the. Time is running out per question, so we've allotted 20 minutes per question. So it's a full hour for the breakout sessions. At the end of the breakout session, you will come automatically come back uh, to the main hall for the closing remarks by uh, by Sharon. And I also want to say thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, so, with that being said, folks, 
Uh, I'm going to get everybody started now. It's going to take about 15 or 10 or 15 seconds for all the breakouts uh, to begin. Uh, once you do, uh, facilitators, they are all yours. Please enjoy your breakout sessions. Thank you, Jeff. Great. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. And Sharon, I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, for any closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, well, first of all, thank you to the participants uh, again. I uh, really appreciate your time and your insights and your contribution today. And we'd like to continue the conversation with you. It's about you know continuing to build relationships within this province. I think we have a common goal, uh, and in this case, it's around workforce development, but that provides meaningful um, livelihoods and uh, and meets the needs of our of our citizens and our communities uh, including and particularly underrepresented groups which is the focus today uh, i want to say thank you stephen's gone i already said thank you but it's really appreciated and uh, uh, but also the nl WIC team it's a, it's a wicked team i always say and this the, these things as you all know don't happen without lots of energy and commitment some humor humor a little bit of humor a lot of it sometimes which is great and uh, so thank you so much. And Suzanne is the, the lead on this and Heather was her um, was the special project uh, uh, lead on this as well. Uh, but Jeff, of course, great support, Lorianne, Joanne, and uh, I hope myself, I'm supposed to be providing that support so well, but I'm, I think it's a wicked team and, and thank you so much for that. Thank you to the facilitators and note, note takers as well. Um, in terms of next steps, just to just to reiterate, a feedback survey will be sent to all participants after today's session. So it'll ask you, do you have anything else you'd like to say about any of those questions? And importantly, what was the experience like in, in just getting registered and participating in this in the technology on this platform and any other comments you'd like to make? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'll send you a summary of the common themes uh, once those are compiled from today, along with the recording of the opening and closing sessions, uh, including uh, Stephen's uh, keynote. And um, and I'm I'm really looking forward to being able to circulate that uh, that uh, that recording. I think that there's a lot of people who aren't here today could really benefit from that. Um, and uh, let me see. Also, the NLWIC team will prepare. will be working on a final report that incorporates the previous two pre consultations, this consultation, and uh, and we're looking forward to putting that in a final report uh, with our recommendations. Um, I wanted to say that uh, Stephen talked about the opportunities for underrepresented groups to really, uh, really take our workforce and therefore our economic recovery to another level. And uh, and and he gave numbers to support that. And and Mike was thinking about you when he talked about the older workers in particular, but also women and youth. So I think that we we've got to kind of continue to build on that data, and we will uh, for sure. Um, so I want to say uh, the only other thing that uh, that the research we all know the research around diversity, equity, inclusion is very positive about number one about it's the right thing to do first of all it's the human thing to do it's the the right thing to do but it also it's it's critical uh, be, having a, an inclusive uh, economy and recovery is is critical it adds to our economic. Um, our fiscal situation, our GDP, it 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 helps businesses do business better, and uh, it, it it really is, and it it allows, uh, I guess, um, higher financial returns, but also population growth. It has a lot of good reasons why we should be doing this. But starting off with, it enriches our communities, it enriches our lives and our organizations. So thank you so much. I wanted to say uh, happy birthday, Jeff, and have a great day, and also all the best. Oh, and Sharon, and sorry, Sharon, Sharon. Yes. <laughs> Chelsea has her hand up. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, uh, who, who's that? Chelsea. That was oh, not Chelsea. Oh, there hi, you Chelsea. are. Hi, Chelsea. Nice to see you. <laughs> I think I just hit it by accident. Okay. <laughs> that's, okay. Well, that's <laughs> fine. It's nice to see you. So uh, I just realized I'm speaking fast again. I do have to apologize to Beverly, and I will send Beverly some notes so that uh, we can make sure. Uh, that uh, that those are circulated as well. So uh, I will learn to slow down. Particularly, that's that's good learning for me. So thanks for the feedback. But stay safe and stay engaged. Okay, everyone, have a great day and uh, take care. <laughs>